for joining us here for International Women's Day as we honour the legacy of the, the late, the Honourable Susan Ryan. I'm really happy to see that we managed to coordinate the venue with its purple seating with International Women's Day and feminist colours. My name is Michelle Ryan. I'm the director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership here at the ANU, and I'm so pleased to be co-emceeing this event with my colleague Fiona Jenkins, who's the convener of the ANU Gender Institute. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. We are in the Cambry precinct here, and the name Cambry was gifted to ANU by our indigenous community, and I celebrate and pay tribute to their elders past and present, and all indigenous people joining us tonight. I also want to acknowledge that this land always was, and always will be, Aboriginal land. To kick off proceedings, please join me in welcoming the Vice-Chancellor to the ANU, Professor Brian Schmidt, to say a few words. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, everyone, for coming out on this uh, raining evening. Uh, Michelle, uh, thank you for your acknowledgement, and I, too, would like to celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands and airwaves uh, we are meeting tonight and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Tonight, ANU is honored to host the first ever annual Susan Ryan Oration, our flagship event for International Women's Day in memory of one of the university's greatest pioneers for equality, the late Honorable Susan Ryan. Before I start, I'd like to ask each of you to imagine the world. For some of us, remember the world we lived in before Susan's work. To quote Susan herself, it was not unlawful to sack women who married or became pregnant, or just because they were women. Maternity leave was scarcely available. Women could not get home loans. Girls' education was restricted, and fewer girls got into higher education. Much of our community thought all of this was just okay. Thanks to Susan, the Australia we live in today has moved well beyond just allowing women to work, have access to parental leave, or to get tertiary education. We are now a society that demands structural changes to ensure that every woman and girl is given every opportunity to succeed and lead. Susan's pioneering work in bringing about anti-discrimination and equal opportunity legislation, whilst also blazing a trail as first female senator for the ACT and being the first female to hold a cabinet role in the Hawke government, those are just a few of the reasons we continue to honor her legacy. She has left a remarkable mark on our world, and I can say on our university as well. She was an active member of our alumni community who generously gave her time to share her knowledge and her views. Tonight, I am so pleased that Samantha Maiden will deliver the inaugural oration. This continues Susan's legacy and drives the important conversations which she helped ignite. Samantha is herself a trailblazer. As a distinguished journalist operating the hallowed halls of the Australian Parliament, Samantha consistently and superbly holds to account our most powerful figures and amplifies the voices of ordinary and extraordinary Australians through her consummate reporting. It is great to have you with us here, uh, Sam, and I'm very keen to hear what you have to say as it's always interesting and always provocative. I have no doubt you would have made Susan proud as our first orator for her oration. I must now take a moment to thank Rory Sutton, Susan Ryan partner, and it was always a pleasure to welcome you back to our campus, Rory. And it's especially important tonight as we honor Susan's memory together and the indelible mark that she left here at ANU. I also extend a warm welcome to many of Susan's friends and family here in the front row who have joined us tonight and throughout the audience. Thank you all for being with us on this uh, really important uh, occasion. Tonight, Rory would like to say a few words. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Rory to the lectern. Thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, uh, Ngunnawal people of this land, 
and pay my respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. I'm here on behalf of Susan's family, siblings Judith, Terry, and Carly, together with her nephew, Tim, and his wife, Susan, my partner, Edna, and Susan's adopted add-ons, Mark Rowan and, uh, Mark and Rowan, rather, plus her close friends, Danielle Wheeler and Derek Abbott. In particular, I want to thank the ANU and Vice-Chancellor Schmidt for establishing this oration in Susan's name to coincide with the International Women's Day. Education was a priority for Susan, and it was at this university that her affinity with literature and the arts was more broadly fostered. The other day, I was walking up William Street in Sydney, I fear to mention that name, but anyway, Sydney, when I encountered a, a serendipitous moment. Emblazoned on a somewhat dubious shop front was the quotation, if you want to achieve greatness, then stop asking for permission. And that seems to be a great motto for today. It is a quote that resonates with me and says so much about Susan. From her earliest days at her convent school in Maroubra, when she refused to play with dolls, to defying Mother Liguri over a maths exercise, Susan always had a strong sense of self. Indeed, it was Mother Liguri who exclaimed, Susan, you're not merely bold as brass, you are brass personified. <laughs> Notwithstanding her innate rebellious inclination, something to do with her Irish background, I think, um, Susan progressed to be head, of, head girl at her school, a leadership pattern reflected throughout her life. And it was her Catholic upbringing that entrenched her desire for justice and equal rights for everybody. Apart from family, as I mentioned, her great passion was for education. As she saw it, education is key to the equality for all and is one of the best investments that a country can make for itself. The imposition, imposition rather, of fee structures such as HEX portended the end, perhaps, of her parliamentary career, but she kept on going, pursuing careers in publishing, superannuation, and as the first age discrimination commissioner with the Human Rights Commission. She fought also vaingloriously, perhaps, for a human rights bill and an Australian Republic. What I remember most about Susan as a public figure is her generosity. Always, she made it clear that her achievements were team achievements. Her political strength was based on persistence. She acknowledged that her 1984 Discrimination Act had its flaws, but created a platform for advances in the future. The all or nothing philosophy was anathema to her. For Susan, it was always about just keep on going. Again, thank you, Vice Chancellor, for this initiative in honoring a remarkable and beautiful human being, Susan Ryan. Finally, I have to say, there can be no one better than Samantha, our Golden Walkley Award winner for 2022, to launch this oration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory, for being here tonight and for your kind words. And thank you, Vice Chancellor, for introducing us. And now, on to our inaugural speaker, Samantha Maiden. As a political editor for news.com.au and as a veteran press gallery journalist, Samantha has been at the forefront of breaking news for more than 20 years. She's been awarded Kennedy Awards and Walkleys for her work, and just over a week ago won the 2021 Gold Walkley Award for her coverage of Open Secret, the Brittany Higgins story that rocked Canberra and our nation. And you can still feel the reverberations from that work. Samantha has carved out a stellar career and reputation, having worked at The Australian and News Corp's Sunday Papers, but her career began in South Australia, where she edited Adelaide University's student newspaper in 1992 and covered state politics, something to note for any budding journalists, student journalists in the room. She's also an author with her first book, Party Animals, published in 2020, and many of us know her from her insightful and thought-provoking commentary and analysis on ABC Insiders and the project as well. And we can't let this one go. She states that one of her career highlights includes being called a mad witch by Peter Dutton. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Samantha Maiden to give the inaugural Susan Ryan oration.
Thank you, that was quite the wrap. I should add there was actually an expletive. Um, there was actually an expletive in the reference to the Mad Witch, but we'll leave that out because this is a family show. Uh, look, I would also like to acknowledge our traditional owners and pay my respects um, to leaders emerging past and present. Uh, look, I'd like to begin tonight by telling a story about Susan Ryan that I really enjoy. Uh, and I suspect that she really enjoyed it as well because uh, she was still telling it um, quite recently to journalists and others right up to her untimely passing. It's a story that takes place in Canberra uh, after the dismissal about, not quite 50 years ago, but around about the year 1975. Many, many Australian expats are outraged by what, have, what has occurred. They want to come back and help and do whatever they can uh, to help the Labor Party avenge this outrage. And one of those people is Germaine Greer. Germaine Greer wants to know what she can do to help. So she comes back, and depending on who tells the story, she either uh, just asks Susan Ryan what she can do or is pestering the Labor Party about what she can do to assist. Finally, a job is found for Germaine Greer. That job is babysitting Susan Ryan's children. <laughs> Now, uh, <laughs> the, the babysitting was more than one off because my understanding is that she actually moved into their house at Aranda. Can you imagine? What an au pair. <laughs> Extraordinary situation. <laughs> and uh, on one blessed day, uh, Susan Ryan goes out to campaign. There's some sort of suggestion it was some sort of our Graspy event and returns home uh, to find her beloved daughter, Justine, having a absolute wingding with Germaine Greer in the family kitchen. They are at war. They've had a huge fight over how to bake a cake. And uh, Justine has apparently pulled out a, a white wings box, which is how she baked cakes. Uh, Germaine, being quite the domestic goddess, uh, has expressed a view that this is outrageous, disgusting. Did your mother even teach you how to bake a cake? Let me tell you how to bake a cake, young lady. And has proceeded to give her a long lecture on how to cream the butter. But I should add, because uh, I spoke to Justine today in the preparation of, of telling this story to get the facts right, she said that Germaine Greer's cake sucked as well. <laughs> And, and this was one of the reasons why Germaine was so incredibly cranky. Now, I don't pretend that this uh, ridiculous story that I've just told you is particularly revelatory in any way, um, but I do believe that the juxtaposition of Justine going head-to-head -head with one of Australia's best-known feminists over how to bake a cake um, is a glorious and beautiful story. And it's a lovely juxtaposition with what... I think is one of Susan Ryan's greatest qualities that I observe as someone who is, you know, I'm basically the generation that's old enough to be her daughter. I was born in 1972, um, I think, you know, six or eight years after her, her daughter, is the incredible modernity of Susan Ryan. You know, if you think about what Susan Ryan, her speeches, what she achieved, her general outlook, um, it's hard to find anything where you think, well, that's incredibly old-fashioned. I don't know if you've noticed that, but if you look at uh, you know, all of the ideas she had and the way she approached things, she seemed to approach things in such a practical way. And uh, her ideas just seemed to me to be so clean and almost timeless. It was almost as if she was someone from another time in the future who was accidentally dropped into that period of time. And she just had such... Uh, I think, you know, clean, clever, smart ideas. Now, as Rory points out, um, she was prepared to start and build. Um, she wasn't um, someone who said, if I don't get everything I want, you know, I'll stop right there, thank you very much. But I think it is um, fascinating to think of the things that she achieved, some of which in an incredible short period of time. I mean, one of her other massive achievements was lifting school retention rates for students in Australia. This was something that obviously didn't just affect women, although it was very helpful for women. In an incredibly short period of time, uh, she managed to get um, Australia away from this idea that everyone leaved school, left school in year 10 to really increasing people to sticking around for year 11 and year 12. 
education was obviously very important to her. She was the pers first person in her family um, to graduate from university. And uh, I always like the fact that I should add, I know that there may be some people here, forgive me now, that are wincing with horror at the idea of a journalist giving this speech in relation to Susan Ryan. But I should just point out that as her memoir reveals, she did actually flirt with the idea of becoming a journalist and she even spent um, some rather boring by the sounds of it time in the Daily Telegraph library where she was cutting out um, stories and research but apparently the women there basically said look don't stick around here because if you stick around here she was quite keen on becoming a journalist apparently um, you, you know you'll end up writing the the social pages or you'll be stuck here in the library you know cutting things out and so, of course, she moved on. Look, I don't know the answer. There'd probably be people in this audience that have a better idea than mine about why her ideas were so modern and where her feminism came from. Uh, reading uh, her speeches and, and reading her book, I do have my own sneaking suspicion if some of this may be the fault of the nuns. Uh, so she did uh, obviously attend a Catholic school and, you know, there is that streak of um, matriarchal society um, that right, runs through Catholic communities in a certain way, right? I mean, like, obviously, the Catholic Church has been um, capable of some things in terms of the prosecution of the rights of women, but perhaps aren't as modern as Susan Ryan would have liked. Um, but nevertheless, there is a real tradition of having really strong, powerful women. And I think what comes out of her book is that even though there was obviously some nuns that she had some good old run-ins with um, in the style of Germaine Greer and the Great White Wings cake packet debacle, um, there were also women that encouraged her to, you know, think... Uh, in a very incisive um, and thorough way. And there's another great story in her um, book, if you get a chance to read it, of one of the nuns flying into an absolute rage about the royal family <laughs> um, because they weren't Catholic. And there was some day, I don't know if it was a picture of Prince Charles or what it was, but someone brought this into show and tell. And the nun apparently theatrically just tore this photograph to pieces and said, don't bring any more pictures of these royals into my classroom because she didn't want any more of that nonsense. Now, uh, in terms of like having a look at Susan Ryan's career in politics, one of the other things that I found joyful and entertaining was just the um, sort of matter-of-factness that she went about entering into a very male-dominated environment. And she obviously had actually quite a, a a god of fun with some of these blokes that were kind of dinosaurs in their own way. And one of the, th the stories that I always quite enjoyed was her interactions with, with Mick Young, who she obviously had a great relationship with, um, who Mick Young also used to constantly refer to women in the Labor Party as boilers. It's not very nice. But this became uh, some sort of running joke between them. And uh, it was, of course, Mick Young who encouraged her to stand um, for the front bench. Uh, but I just wanted to read, if I may, a little bit from her book, which I found quite enjoyable, uh, that when she indeed, um, I think it was in December 1977, put her name forward for the front bench, um, when they did the vote, there were actually two women that ended up on the board in the first vote. And after the first count of uh, the ballot, um, Jean Mills's name was up on the blackboard as well as mine. Not two boilers, yelled Mick in tones of horror. <laughs> now, he was, of course, joking. Everybody laughed at this. But subsequently, this became a bit of a running joke to the point where everyone, according to Susan Ryan, including herself, referred to themselves as the boilers. Mick acknowledged that there were young boilers as old ones and then would ask the boilers what their opinions were. What do the boilers think about this new means test? Where would the boilers line up on uranium? <laughs> he would inquire. A top boiler was a reference to incredible party worker Susie Carlton. And uh, her own daughter, Justine, was referred to as a knockout of a young boiler. Um, now, look, of course, there would be many people these days that would be completely horrified by this. But it seems to me fairly obvious that Mick Young was actually a huge supporter and an encourager of um, Susan Ryan's ambitions. Then, of course, we come to uh, the 1984 Sex Discrimination Act. Those of you who have enjoyed, I don't know who, how many of you have watched it, probably a few, I suspect, 
uh, Annabelle Crabbe's documentary, Misrepresented, will remember the fantastic story that is told in there about the abject horror at the idea that the sex discrimination reform agenda would lead to truck drivers leaving their wives. Uh, there was a great deal of concern um, that there would need to be co-drivers sleeping in the cab, um, the men would be tempted, and this would be a terrible state of affairs. I also enjoyed the fact that the sex discrimination bill was no longer referred to in that matter um, in many instances. It was simply shortened to Susan's sex bill, um, which sounds like something that you would want to vote for, um, but I, I don't know if it was really uh, that helpful. Now, look... Uh, this speech is not about me, uh, but I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself so you knew a little bit about where I'm coming from and how the ideas of Susan Ryan have, you know, played a role in my own upbringing, in my own university career uh, and all the rest of it. So I'm from Adelaide originally. Um, I was born in 1972 um, when, of course, the Whitlam government was elected and there's an absolutely chilling and quite creepy story that's told in my family that at the age of three, when presumably I couldn't read, but I must have been able to like, hear conversations on the bus, that on the day after the dismissal and the days following, there were all these, you know, headlines saying, you know, goff out and Fraser in. And I apparently sitting on the bus in Adelaide said to my mother, does that mean Mr Fraser's the Prime Minister now? Which prompted uh, some woman, quite rightly, to turn around on the bus and say, that's a very unusual child. <laughs> because, uh, and you could say it was my first political news report at the age of <laughs> three. Um, not a very good one. Like, I think I just had big flappy ears and I was listening to people on the bus. But nonetheless, quite entertaining. So I went to university in Adelaide. Um, I grew up with uh, all of the stories of the fact that um, women of my mother's generation had to give up their work when they were married, uh, or certainly when they were pregnant. And so I do remember hearing the story of my mother and my mother's friends. She worked as a bank teller. And at that stage, I'm not sure if the rules had changed slightly, like it seemed to me that she did keep working after she got married, um, but as soon as you were pregnant, you absolutely had to go. And so there was a lot of, um, I suppose, just getting a bit fatter and fatter and fatter and then trying to sort of leave it as long as you could um, before you actually confirmed what was going on. And it's extraordinary to think about the fact that those things were happening, um, you know, even in the early 1970s or and the late 1960s, um, because I think most of... Um, the people in this room like fine wine or of a certain vintage and so nothing, this will come as a terrible shock to you. But I think that there is a younger generation of women that, uh, and men who would find that uh, quite extraordinary and quite amazing. Um, so I attended university in Adelaide and that was really my first uh, interaction uh, and exposure to um, feminism and, you know, a proper dose of activism. Now... One of the things that I always remember, and I've actually thought about in recent years, is that early on in my career, uh, well, my studies, I suppose I should say more uh, accurately, there were two things that occurred. One was uh, that I was friends with a lady called Amy Barrett, uh, who was the women's officer at Adelaide University. And she was raising concerns that um, during orientation week, we had these things called O-week camps. I don't know if they still have them anymore. And there was this sort of running issue where there'd be a lot of alcohol and a lot of fooling around. And, you know, like there's nothing wrong with that to some extent. But it became really apparent that the O-Week leaders, who were largely men, were using these O-Week camps as a bit of a sexual happy hunting ground. And Amy Barrett came up with the idea that perhaps was it really so unreasonable that um, was it a crazy idea uh, that we, as terms of the student services and student union, owed these young uh, students some duty of care and that there should be a rule that basically the O-Week leaders should, can they, you know, keep their hands to themselves for four days. Well, this caused, like, an incredible outrage. We were, like, the fun police, right? We were told that this was so outrageous. I mean, you know, today it seems completely normal, but I still remember this gross outrage at this suggestion. And I remember saying to some of these boys, because they were boys at that time, 
I remember saying, look, if it's the love of your life, I mean, I don't think they were really necessarily looking for the love of your life, but I said, look, can't you just wait like four days? Like, it's, I mean, you can go and take them to the uni bub afterwards, but they were thoroughly horrified and outraged by this. Nonetheless, our reform was enacted. Uh, now, the other thing that happened around the same time was that I was unwittingly involved in branch stacking of a women on campus group. I didn't mean to, it was a complete accident. I'll explain how it occurred. So um, during that orientation week period, there was a group on campus, the main women's group called Women on Campus. We had the best rooms in the cloisters. It was down in the basement. We had like a kitchen and a whole region study. It was like a entire bunker, a ladies bunker. It was really good. And um, during O week, it was suggested to me that some of the older women were kind of bored at sitting on the desk where you sign people up. So, I, like, I was dispatched to go sit there. Now, I just had no agenda whatsoever other than I thought that I should smile at people and try and get people to join up, right, because they were paying, I don't know if it was 50 cents or a dollar. So, anyway, I kept smiling my head off, and at the end of it, we had hundreds of new members, which I'm not sure if they completely uh, agreed with, but it was fine. Like, we didn't expect everyone to turn up. Um, but the, the as a result of this... Um, it was foisted upon me that I should become the convener of women on campus, which I was um, properly horrified by to some extent, but agreed to do. And the interesting thing about that, I'll come back to this later, is that one of the women uh, that uh, we were involved with at Women on Campus was actually Kate Thornton, um, who some of you will know was the woman who came forward with the allegations in relation to the former attorney general. General Christian Porter that obviously he denies. So she was actually one of our contemporaries at university, as was a whole group of women that will come as no surprise to you these days, Penny Wong, Natasha stott um, Jay Weatherall, who became the South Australian um, Premier, Christopher Pine and so on. And it was during this period that there was another gentleman that came to our attention who later became the Treasurer in South Australia, and his name was Jack Snelling. And he came to our attention during O Week because uh, he decided that in the interest of prosecuting uh, the, his beliefs in terms of pro-life and anti-abortion, that he should roam the cloisters of Parliament, of, not Parliament House, I should say, Adelaide University, with um, replica fetuses. And uh, look, there's always a bit of a debate, obviously, about protests and the right to protest, and obviously I do support the right to protest, but... A lot of the women who were on campus at the time also had the concern that, you know, female students and, and sometimes male journalists, as, male students as well, had the right to be able to go about their business and go around O-Week without having this literally shoved in their faces. So anyway, for our crimes against humanity for raising this idea, um, Amy Barrett, who I referred to earlier, the women's officer, was invited um, to appear on the, a program that was quite a popular program in Adelaide at the time, a bit of late night listening. Um, it was the Father John Fleming Show. And the Father John Fleming Show was run by this Anglican priest who later became Catholic. You, you, there are a few of those. And uh, basically, Amy sort of decided that uh, she was going to go on, but she was going to debate this gentleman called Jack Snelling, who 20 years later became the South Australian Treasurer, who was the one running around university with the but babies, and um, she sort of said, well, this is uh, two against one, right? Like, I need to bring a friend. So she said, can you come in and hang out with me and debate Father John Fleming? And I went, oh, God, okay. So I went on the Father John Fleming show, and the, end, the, the, the charming end to this story is that henceforth, we were described in Festival of Light Literature, which was a conservative organisation in Adelaide at the time, not as pro-choice, not even as pro-abortion. We were referred to as abortionists. <laughs> now, look, I just want to say that if there's any ladies in the audience tonight that have any gynaecological questions, I will absolutely do my best to answer them. <laughs> but I just want to make it very clear that I don't have a medical practising certificate, uh, despite what you may have read in the um, Festival of Light literature at the time. Look, um, the other reason why I'm here, obviously, tonight, and the reason why I told that story was to kind of give you a bit of an arc of the story of how I became involved in um, the Brittany Higgins story, uh, which is obviously one of the reasons that I was uh, 
asked to attend and, and give this speech tonight. I think what's really fascinating is to think about the fact that without Susan Ryan and without the Sex Discrimination Act, we wouldn't have a Sex Discrimination Commissioner, we wouldn't have a Kate Jenkins, we wouldn't have um, a Jenkins report that was commissioned and then called about Parliament House. And of course, the treatment of women uh, it, it goes much more broadly than Parliament House. But I think the reason why Brittany Higgins' story was such a lightning rod for debate was that there really was this concern about if that can happen to that person allegedly in that forum, uh, you know, what on earth is going on and why weren't a greater protections put in place, uh, you know, to, to help that person after that accusation was made. I need to say, as I say in every instance of this, that um, a man has been charged in relation to this matter. He has pleaded not guilty. And obviously, I don't want to say anything tonight that would interfere with that process. Justice needs to uh, take place. And we'll see that unfolding over the um, coming months. The only thing that I would say is this, which is I think it is going to be very confronting for a lot of Australians. And I'm not sure if people are ready for this in the sense that for many, many years, we have become used to the idea that um, sexual assault trials are run in a, in a manner in which the alleged victim is uh, almost a ghostly figure, right? Anonymous, not known, you don't know their face. Now, that is absolutely their right, but it is also dehumanising, right? Like they're kind of this person that you almost can't see as flesh and blood. And that is, you know, one of the long-term... Um, you know, aspects of the fact that we still see in some ways rape and sexual assault crimes as something that is to be hidden or something that is to be shamed for in some way. Now, I still think that um, people that who are the victims or the alleged victims of these crimes have absolutely the right to anonymity, but it has been really fascinating to see this new generation of women, whether it's Grace Tame or Brittany Higgins or the sexual consent work that um, Chanel Contos has done, really sort of throwing that cloak off and saying, uh, I want to be able to speak my truth and, and discuss what happened to me. And there's a lot of challenges that arise for that in terms of the justice system and how to manage that. And we're going to see that um, played out in, in real terms, in, in real time during the trial. Uh, the final thing I would like to say is a couple of things in that space. The first is that um, I think there probably would even still be some people in this room that would be surprised to learn all those years after Susan Ryan introduced the Sex Discrimination Act that uh, it didn't apply to MPs. And why is that? Um, well, uh, I write about that in my new book, which hopefully might be out later this year. We'll, we'll see. Um, but a, a lot of it relates to parliamentary privilege. And so people traditionally think of parliamentary privilege as about the right to basically defame people, get up in parliament and um, say things without the risk of defamation action. Um, but parliamentary privilege, of course, also extends to the right of MPs to go about their business without being... Uh, threatened or, uh, you know, sort of stopped from speaking their mind and, and going about their business. And so there'd been this traditional idea that, oh, you couldn't possibly allow staff or people to make allegations of that nature about MPs because people might blackmail them or people might use it to threaten them or to bring them down. And, of course, all of that is entirely possible. But what it meant was that there was just this group of political staffers that had far less industrial rights than most normal people would in most normal workplaces. And that is something that is also being um, exposed and prosecuted um, by women like Rochelle Miller, who is the woman who came out and um, said that um, she had had an extramarital affair with Alan Tudge. Uh, she's a good example of, of how you know, the system is very tough on women that come out and make those allegations. She's had a really rough time. Uh, you know, she had that report come out recently which she didn't participate in uh, and the leaking of further texts to newspapers that actually weren't even part of that report to basically paint her as a bit of a disgruntled lover. But I think that she really deserves... Uh, respect for the fact that this was a conversation that she helped start and this was also a conversation that inspired, interestingly enough, Brittany Higgins to come forward because um, even though uh, Rochelle Miller was not making any allegation of um, sexual harassment, 
uh, watching the way she was bad-mouthed when she came out on that Four Corners program and revealed what had happened to her and the fact that she felt that she was sort of managed out of the system and managed out of a job when she came forward with those allegations, I think really radicalised Brittany Higgins in a way. Uh, today is, of course, International Women's Day, and uh, in the last couple of days, there's been quite a high-profile case, uh, high-profile campaign released uh, that features um, the very well-known faces of Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame and Chanel Contos. And in the last 24 hours, there's been quite a strong critique of that um, from the journalist and activist Nina Fennell, who said that she doesn't think she, she, it made her embarrassed about feminism in this country, not criticising those women specifically, but making the point that feminism should be more about, you know, n not just about women in power suits, as she described it, um, you know, Instagram filters, uh, the hierarchy of survivors and victims, as she put it, that can sometimes elevate people uh, that are regarded as, inverted commas, good victims. Like, this is a really rough discussion to have because obviously all of the women involved in that have experienced um, trauma. Uh, but I think it is worth uh, having that discussion as well and I'd welcome any questions in relation to that. Um, it's also a reminder though of just the note that I'd want to finish on, which is this, which is that the stories of Grace Tame and the stories of Brittany Higgins' alleged rape are very inspiring to a lot of women because they have shown incredible bravery and courage and they've decided to speak out. But I don't think you should ever underestimate that the huge burden that places on those women, uh, the fact that it is very traumatic to speak out, I think that sometimes a younger generation uh, can see it in almost a very airbrushed way. You see the front page of Marie Claire magazine, you see the Instagram pictures, uh, but I don't think you see the unrelenting trauma of providing your trauma as some sort of blood sacrifice on the road to change. And I think as we go on, we've got to find better ways of achieving change than putting that burden on those women. As powerful as those stories are, uh, it's hard to resist them because they look at what's happened in the last year. They have driven incredible change. But I don't think that you can underestimate the burden um, that it places on those women. And so we've got to find ways, I think, to support those women more. Thank you. Um, I hope that that was informative or useful or provided uh, some avenue for uh, questions. And if I've said anything that offends you or you think is horrific, please stand up and let me know. Thank you. Thanks so much, Samantha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a wonderful talk. Now, Do you want to? Well, it's up to you. You could. I can just stand. Stay here. Like. Okay. Yeah, cool. Sure. All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Fiona Jenkins. I'm the convener of the ANU Gender Institute. And um, we're now going to move to the Q&A part of the evening, um, where you get to ask Samantha anything, anything you like, pretty much. <laughs> um, so um, if you want to ask a question, please come down to the front. There's a microphone there. Um, and um, while you're thinking about your question and, and coming down, I'd like to um, begin with a question. Um, Samantha, I was wondering, when you um, were, were breaking these stories around Parliament House and what happened to Brittany Higgins and so forth, um, did you have a strong sense that the time was right for those stories? And how do you have a sort of sense of the time being one in which that's going to be heard in a way that's, that's powerful and doesn't just become a kind of backlash against the individual do you want to involved? Do you want me to grab that microphone? Um, just have this for now, we'll sort okay, out the sure. microphone. Oh, oh, that's my fault. Can't take me anywhere. Um, look, I'd love to say that there was like some huge strategy in relation to the Brittany Higgins story, um, but there wasn't. There was a lot of work that went into it. I mean, she uh, basically came to, started talking to me in early January of 2021, and uh, I sat down and did a very long interview, about two and a half hours, at my house in O'Connor, just around the corner from here, um, in mid-January. And then I basically said to work, 
uh, and you can't underestimate what a big deal this was for me to say to work because I work obviously for a digital news site where you often write multiple stories a day. I basically said, look, I really need to take a week off to go through and completely do this transcript and, you know, there's a lot of potential angles here to pursue. So um, they were really supportive about that and that was really good. But, like, we just thought it was a important story and, you know, I, I remember the most... The biggest memory I have of those early days was her sort of saying to me, do you think anyone's going to care? Like, will anyone pay any attention to this? Like, will it be a fizzer? And so it was quite shocked, like it was like being in the middle of a cyclone when it all went off. And part of that was to do with, you know, there was all these new revelations and we found out things about them cleaning the room and um, this long list of who knew what and when and this idea of did they have a don't ask, don't tell um, culture and why the Prime Minister wasn't even told about it over the three days that we were negotiating with his office for answers and it just sort of blew up. But, I mean, I think at the end of the day the reason why it blew up was because women were like, had this white hot anger. And uh, for some reason, that story kind of just ignited the flame. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really such a powerful story. And can I ask you to just address briefly as well the questions around the sort of trauma that's, that's carried then by people who bring those stories forward? How do you um, engage with that as, as a journalist again? How do you yes. do that responsibly? Yes. Well, I took up smoking. Uh, <laughs> And I hadn't, I hadn't really, I had smoked a little uh, when I was writing my first book, but uh, I went out during the first week and I thought, gee, I'd love to buy a packet of cigarettes. So I got a packet of Marlboro Ice Blast and uh, I, start, I just smoked a lot and uh, drank a lot of Diet Coke. So real, really sort of positive, healthy things. And... Um, uh, look, I've, I've sort of tried... I'm, I'm usually pretty good. I'm a bit of an all-or-nothing person with that sort of devices. And so when I'm into it, you know, I go hard. But, like, this year I've sort of thought I need to stop smoking. But who knows? I might go past the servo on the way home. <laughs> We've got a question. Sorry, that is really bad and I don't <laughs> recommend that. But, yeah, I'm just being honest. Katerina. Hi, Samantha. I was just wondering, as one of the most senior uh, women in the press gallery, whether you had any reflections on your time there working with other senior journalists and your um, approach to the vitriol that is sometimes thrown at you in, um, in the cyber world in your reporting and mm. the commentary that you get from, yeah, from trolling yes. and things like that. Look, I'm so glad you asked because you've just reminded me that there was this funny story I was going to tell that I forgot to tell when I was speaking and now I'm going to subject you to it. So, um, look, in the broad, uh, I, look, it's sort of, it's really hard to explain because, or maybe it's not hard to explain if you're female, but like, it's not like I've ever felt like discriminated against, but then that's kind of a lie, but I'll come to that. But what I always felt, and a lot of this was sort of internalised when I got to the press gallery, was first of all, I thought, right, you've got to learn to shout at press conferences, right? Because you've got all these men and they're all yelling and different prime ministers have different approaches. Like Morrison is very controlling and he... Can you imagine? <laughs> and and he, he basically likes to actually, I think, seriously mess with your head by like picking... Like, oh, this person, this person. And you're going, oh, I, I want to... I've got a question. And he's like, no, no question for you over here. <laughs> and like at the end of it, sometimes you actually just want to... Gently kill him. Uh, but basically, you know, when Howard was the Prime Minister and, and that's, like, I sort of, you know, that's when I kind of arrived during the Howard years. You had to learn... First of all, Howard was, like, you know, you didn't ask a dumb... If you asked a dumb question, he would, like, murder you on the street with a look. Um, but you had to learn to shout. So, anyway, so I learnt to, like... Right? And you've got to, like, learn to, like... Like, keep going, right? Like, so if, like, other people are shouting and you just keep going and you've got to, like, thunder over them, right? And that's what you have to do, or that's what I thought you had to do. Anyway, when you learn to do that, that's when they start thinking you're a real bitch. <laughs> and, the, and the, you know, it's like, oh, my God, like, she's so intimidating and she's so loud. And what, does she think she can ask all the goddamn questions? So, I don't know, there was a bit of that. But the funny uh, story I was going to tell was that... Um, so when, it's the only time that I remember sort of feeling pretty kind of like uh, 
bruised was uh, after the first birth of my first child because I told work that I was coming back to work relatively quickly because it was an election year, it was 2007, and everybody reacted with complete horror, right? Like, and, oh, and also sort of laughter, right? Like, kind of like, oh, you've never had a baby before. Like, you won't be back. And I was sort of, in the end, had to sort of say to people, I'm not sure if you understand. Like, my partner's taking a year off. I'm taking four months off. And if I don't come back to work, when I say I'm coming back to work, I will be homeless. I won't have an income. But anyway, no one would really believe me. And they didn't take me seriously. And then as soon as I came back to work, it was completely office obvious that I'd been gently kind of shoved into the weeds. And um, one of the things that happened that I always remember, which was this absolutely lovely guy who was the chief of staff, and he was the nicest man. <laughs> and unfortunately, Christine Wallace is going to probably know who I'm talking about. But anyway, he was, um, he was so lovely. And he basically, when I first got back to work in the first week, he said, oh, God, you know, like, you're coming back to work very quickly. He goes, I hope you're breastfeeding. Uh, and I said, yeah, I am. Like, but, like, oh, my God, how bad would I feel if I wasn't? But the punchline to this story was that despite the enthusiasm for some of the blokes in my, uh, you know, the press gallery to check that I was breastfeeding, there wasn't much um, kind of regard for how this would be practically achieved. Now, um, at the time, there was nowhere to, like, breastfeed or express milk or whatever. And so... And, and you kind of internalise the idea that this needs to be hidden, right? And so, sorry, you should sit down. I'm sorry, I'm going on and on and on. And, and so, but basically what happened was I went to see the nurses at Parliament House and I said, is there somewhere that I could, like, strap myself to an electric... What a mental image. Uh, breast pump, right? And they were like, yeah, yeah, you can... Like, there's this storage room out of the back of the nurses and you can go out there. So I go in there with a the plug myself in and, you know, and then, like, basically I realised that it's like this chipboard, it's not even a proper wall, with, like, the tea room to the security guards and so they can't see me but they, they could probably hear this, you know, but then I can hear them all lunchtime going, yeah, what about this and that and expletives flying and then what would happen like clockwork about 15 minutes is the very nice man who wanted to check if I was breastfeeding would call and he would say, Samantha, where are you? You're not at your desk. You've been gone for two. And I was like, I'm just downstairs. I'm getting something done. And he'd be like, are you, you know, like, well, you've been gone for 20 minutes. Like, when are you coming back? And the really weird thing was that for some reason, because I'd internalised this whole idea that, like, they were really dark on me coming back, that I didn't feel able to say, well, I've got my tit in a breast front pump, mate, and I'm pumping milk. Isn't that what you wanted? Well, I'm hap it's happening. So, you know, I didn't feel able to say that. So, anyway, that's what I said. But on the social media stuff, look, I know this is not a very popular view and it probably reflects very poorly on me, but I could not give a shit what people think about me on the internet, right? So, people, like, yeah, so people say all sorts of the normal things you expect, that, like, I'm fat and I'm a bitch and I'm a cow and I'm ugly and all the rest of it, and I'm like, thank you for identifying yourself, you're blocked. <laughs> and then I just never think about it again. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Samantha. Thanks very much for a fantastic presentation. Thank um, you. I suspect that you and I had children at the childcare centre at oh, Parliament wow. House at the same time. I hope my child did never bite yours. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have any memories. Give them of hand that. and foot disease or something. <laughs> I would Good like now. you to um, look into your crystal ball, gay, um, yeah. crystal ball, please, and think about whether whether what's happened in the last year is likely to have any impact on this year's federal election. So do you think that as a consequence of a massive march, two massive marches, all of the media coverage of Brittany Higgins, Grace mm. Tame, all of the allegations, all of the 28 recommendations of Kate Jenkins, that's going to have an impact in terms of how Parliament will change and whether voters will think about that when they go... Yeah. to cast their ballot? Well, in terms of whether it's changed Parliament, like it already has, right? Like, so there's been legal changes and there's now, you know, independent complaints mechanisms. So there's no doubt it's changed that. And that's important, but, I mean, it's also one workplace and it's a workplace largely populated by, you know, highly educated, fairly affluent, um, you know, well-off men and women. I'm not saying all of them are, but to a large extent they are. I think the interesting thing with the election campaign is this. There's obviously, like, a, a fairly large rusted-on of people 
that are kind of Scott Morrison haters, right? They're never going to change their vote. They, they, they clutched onto that because they think it's evidence that, you know, he is malfeasant in some way. And that's not going to affect the election campaign. I think the more interesting thing that could affect the election campaign is this kind of golden thread that runs through the criticism of Scott Morrison, whether it's in relation to Hawaii in the bushfires or the matter of Brittany Higgins or the vaccine rollout, and that pertains to competency, right? So uh, in the case of the bushfires, there was this idea of, like, the boss pissing off in a crisis, right? It was like, my, we are literally on fire and you're sipping a Mai Tai in Hawaii. Like, what is your deal? And then he says things like, oh, I don't hold a hose sort of suggesting that, you know, he can't make much of a difference. And so in that instance, I think some people would go, well, what, what are you doing that job for, right? Like, why aren't you out here? No one's asking you to hire, hold a hose. People are asking you to run uh, a, an emergency management response to this matter. Now, in the case of Brittany Higgins, again, I stress, you know, these allegations are before the courts and it will be decided in that forum. But I think there was a lot of questions and concerns about how that matter was handled, right? after the allegation was made and, and people were like, my God, like you can't even look after your own staff. So once again, it goes to a question of competency and I think there was a bit of annoyance with some of his kind of, you know, daggy dad responses to various things that people thought were a bit tone deaf. And then obviously the example of the vaccine rollout, once again, that people thought that that um, lacked competency. So that's where I think that it will have an impact. I mean, like we did a story today on polling in the seats of independence where there was a yep. much higher proportion of women that were backing female independence and that there were a much higher proportion of uh, women who thought that the government wasn't very good on these issues. But once again, you know, I think there's four or five high profile independents running. I'd be a bit surprised if more than, you know, one to three got up. Right. Maybe only one. So we'll see. Hi, um, great uh, lecturer, it's fantastic. Oh, hello, I know you from Twitter. Twitter, a great place to network. Um, I just have two questions. Uh, one, you're talking about different prime ministers and how they, um, I guess, treated the you know, press conference. I'm wondering, did you notice any difference in the toxicity of Parliament House, depending on the prime minister, or in the press gallery, depending on the prime minister? And my second question is, I mean, I've been researching sexism in politics for nearly a decade now, so my whole adult life. Um, and I was quite shocked at what happened last year. Were you shocked? Were people in the press gallery shocked? Oh, you mean when the Prime Minister got up and, and sort of made this allegation that I'd been chasing people around in toilets without saying my name? I was like, what? <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? No, in terms of 2021, the, the, the reckoning, the so-called reckoning in quote marks. So I've got PTSD. I thought you were talking about something else. <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, I guess, you know, we all knew it was bad, but did we all know, like, did, did you guys know it was that bad? Like, both in the press gallery, but also just in, in Parliament House? Well, I think it's a bit darker than that. I think we thought it was normal. Oh, God. <sighs> so, yeah. Like, I, I think that there were things that weren't great, but I think we kind of accepted a lot of them. I don't know that's probably not the answer you're looking for. No, it's heavy. It's um, But, yeah, like, I mean, I, I had observed... Uh, you know, like, you've got to remember that um, there was a group of Labor women that came out and they had a Facebook group and talked about um, the treatment of women uh, in Labor ranks, right? Um, and it's sort of fascinating that it's the Liberal Party women that have come out and broken ranks and spoken out. There's not as many Labor women that have done that. And I think there's a variety of reasons for that. One is, I think, that the Labor Party, not always, but can be a bit better at looking after people after they manage them out of jobs at Parliament House. The Liberal Party is, um, you know, they'll find them a job, you know, because sometimes people are moved out of political offices through no real fault of their own, right? Like the MP just, this goes to the lack of industrial rights. The MP just decides that they don't want that person or there's a factional shift or they get rid of them. I'm not saying this always happens, but the Labor Party is a lot smarter at saying well, we'll find you a job in a union or we'll, we'll look after you. And so you're still kind of in the system, if that makes sense. And there's obviously good things and bad things about that because it can be silencing as well. But I think that the Liberal Party tended to just throw these women on the scrap heap a, a bit more. And so they basically decided they didn't have anything to lose and they would just kind of speak out. But, like, I had observed myself, and I do write a little bit about this in my book, that... 
you know, I, I thought there was a real period during the Rudd-Gillard years, um, which were obviously incredibly stressful and, like, hung parliament and all the rest of it and multiple leadership challenges and just emotional disturbance and people... Just, just a lot of drama, right? Um, that I think there... I'm not saying across the board everywhere, but there was, I think, a, a culture of a lot of um, casual sex, right? Um, where sometimes that's fine, right? Like, it's consensual. There's no problem with it. But I, I felt... And, and the women did write about this in the Facebook groups. I felt there was a, an era... There was, a, there was a certain period in time where I felt like some women were really kind of being treated like sexual meat in the Labor Party, right? Like, that... Um, it was just a really gross culture and uh, I suppose, you know, like uh, some, you know, people are allowed to, you know, if, if they're working in those environments, right, like where else are they going to meet someone to some extent? But I think that if you get to a point where there's just lots of kind of sexual interaction between these people that are working in this hothouse environment uh, and then sometimes those, sometimes men and maybe sometimes women too, but sometimes men are being quite sort of dismissive of these women afterwards and sort of, you know, you'd hear stories about men having sex with women who were Labor staffers and then just like not even looking at them when they'd walked past in the hallway, right? And, you know, that's relatively, that's like 10 years ago. So, yeah, I think there's some stuff that went on that was a little unhealthy. I mean, I don't want to sound like a prude or anything, right? Like, but uh, I just kind of... I don't think it was always a very good environment for those women. Thanks. One last question. Good evening, good Samantha. Evening. My connection to you is... Uh, this is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, honestly. This afternoon, I, picked my, I took my grandson to a music lesson and I said, oh, I've got to get home, I've got to go to... Um, the ANU, to listen to Samantha Maiden. And he said, oh, her son's in my science class, I think it is, <laughs> at high school. So that's a bit of an obscure collection, wow. connection, isn't it? <laughs> but what I, want to, what I want to say is, and ask about, is I attended that... I've been to a lot of... I've, in my lifetime, I've attended a lot of protests. And I went to that March... One and I, I was getting ready to go, and a friend who I go to the football with, and have never really talked much about politics with, she said, "Are you going to the protest? I'll meet you down at the bus stop near the ANU, and we'll go in." And we got on the bus, and then there was this really frail lady on the bus, and she tentatively asked, "Were we going to the protest?" And I said, "Yes," and I'll. I'll she was, didn't know where to get off. I said, look, I'll, I'll take you there. I know where to get off and how to walk up. And we got there fairly early. And my question is, and I haven't heard any comments about the number of older ethnic women who were at that protest. Did anyone observe that? Yeah, I, I went to that protest uh, to cover it, obviously, as a journalist. And, um, look, I didn't necessarily notice large numbers of older ethnic women, but what I did notice was incredible generational spread, right? Mm. Uh, so there were, like, children there, there were teenagers, um, there were, you know, women in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, and there was a huge contingent of um, more senior women. Um, and... Yeah, like, I I wish that I fully understood why that story exploded in the way that I did. It did, right? But I don't... I still don't really understand, right? Like, I... I it, because the awful thing about it is what Brittany Higgins actually spoke about in her speech at that rally, where she talked about the banality of it, right? That um, she talked about the fact that this actually happens all the time. That's the truth of it. Now, I think that has some connection, clearly, with the fact that so women, many women came out, right? Um, but it was just a very powerful experience. Um, and it felt like there was something quite sort of electric and it felt like you were in the middle of some sort of natural weather pattern, right? Like, it, it really did feel quite incredible and I still don't really have the answer for why 
that story in that moment at that time. Um, obviously, it had something to do with the fact of the, you know, the building in which it occurred. Um, but I think that it did have a huge impact that sort of transcended politics. I think most of the time people don't really pay attention to politics. But for whatever reason, women got really angry and women you wouldn't expect got on that bus with you or got on that tram and, and went to the rally. Well, uh, from my own experience, I would suggest that I could name how many... Pe I, I wouldn't name, but there'd be so many people in my life who I could never have told on. Mm. And it seemed like that Brittany Higgins was that mouthpiece for our generation mm. where you just couldn't say... The, the ramifications for saying anything were just too great. Yeah. You just sucked it up. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, you know, I think that it was the bravery of her in doing mm. that that um, was just... It's not inspiring. It was like a release. Yeah. Right? I, I, yeah. I think so. Yeah. It was, a, it was an amazing opportunity to start to talk about things in a, in a yeah, much more collective way. Which I think way. was really good, but again, as I said earlier, I think that it's also a huge burden to put on the shoulders of a couple mm. of women. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much, you. Samantha. Thank you. And um, please go and um, yes, sorry if you'd like to. No. <laughs> I'm sorry about that too. No, no, do stay up here because we, we, we want to thank you. Oh, we want to thank you. Don't disappear. Don't disappear. I've been jabbering on for long enough. <laughs> no, I want to thank, um, I want to thank, first of all, hang on. Um, thank you so much for that very powerful um, oration and uh, all the wonderful stories that you told and just a sense of your incredible journey. I mean, I think, you know, you, you present it, you, you're obviously an incredibly strong person, um, but some of the things you've done have been very brave and very challenging, I think, and, I, and that's an amazing kind of persistence that um, I think we really uh, need to recognise and, and honour in, in women who really push the boundaries of um, the worlds that we inhabit and really change change uh, cultures in that way. I also want to thank um, our Vice-Chancellor and Susan Ryan's family for their vision in, in, in inaugurating this annual oration and everyone who's been involved in, in organising it. Thank you. Um, it's been a wonderful um, discussion and evening and thank you, Michelle, for opening our proceedings uh, tonight. I just want to conclude with some of my own reflections on what we've just heard and, and just the extraordinary debt that we owe to Susan Ryan. Um, and the fight that she had to get the Sex Discrimination Act through federal parliament in the early 1980s, which really was the beginning of a kind of cultural war that we've kept returning to um, this evening, because it, it sought to end a world in which things were normalised, as you put it. You know, routine sexual harassment was deemed to be the price that women had to pay in order to simply enjoy the privilege of being at work, which was deemed to be a male domain. And the strength of those kinds of norms and the kind of violence that attached to policing them is, is really, you know, in many ways, what we're still living through, what we're still fighting. Even at the same time as it's very hard for this generation to even understand a world when a woman could be legally sacked for, for being pregnant or being married or just for being a woman. I mean, that's, that seems eons away, and yet this kind of culture war that we're within still um, continues. And I just want to recall Susan Ryan's leadership and her fighting spirit working beside many leading lights of her generation. Um, we thank her for that first round, as it were, of the fight. And I want to thank you, Samantha, for your role, uh, along with others of your generation and this up-and-coming generation who are so willing to have the courage to speak out and report and open these battle lines up again and recognise that the fight isn't over. This is often, you know, a very tough battle. And one of the things that uh, Susan Ryan said was, my skin never grew thick enough. Um, but nonetheless, she persisted. She continued uh, with the fight. And I think persistence, as you have mentioned and has been mentioned by Rory as well this evening, is a, is a feminist lesson. Uh, there are practices that we only learn through persisting uh, in the company, hopefully, of some allies, um, in sharing stories, in listening to uncomfortable truths, 
in holding the powerful accountable. And all of those things, I think we, we thank you very much for, Samantha, in, in your work. Um, of course, sometimes an avalanche comes along and clears some of the path, and I think uh, Susan Ryan, obviously, as you said, did not act alone. She was working in, in alliance with all these very powerful um, feminists who brought huge cultural change to Australia in the 70s and 80s. And perhaps we are in, we're seeing something similar happen today with that, you know, as you said, a kind of the climate of the Women's March for Justice, which is such a powerful expression of women's anger at what has been happening. And indeed, just here on ANU, forms of abuse and violence that, that were seen as normal, that were passed over and ignored just a few years ago, are now being reported, are being uh, spoken about, are being acknowledged, and people are held accountable for what they've done. So although all of these incidents are very disturbing, and I mark what you say about the trauma there, um, and so important to remember and recognize that, um, we also should acknowledge the institutional change that comes with a willingness to, to listen and to hear these stories. And we are hopeful that the kind of cultural change that we have seen come about will, will keep moving things along, will keep us moving in the right um, directions. So, on behalf of us all, I would like to thank um, Samantha very warmly for her inspiring words this evening and the challenge to take further action that I think she has put to all of us. Um, please join with me in showing our appreciation. Thank you.